Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is the Python Community News, the show that brings you the non-pip installable news around the Python community. Uh, back in my actual studio in San Diego, I'm Jay Miller, and with me as always... Still from New York, I'm John Bonifato. John, I just realized my door is open, and I'm going to close that door, but I'm going to start by saying we have some very big meta-ish PCN news to cover. Uh, why don't you tell everybody about our new Twitter account? I will. So, uh, yeah, if you've been following along the podcast and the, and the YouTube live stream so far, uh, you know, we've been doing uh, all of these streams from uh, the YouTube channel you're watching right now, uh, which is Jay's, Jay's own YouTube channel. But uh, we have some, some pretty important announcements around that. Uh, so we've got a brand new Twitter account for Python Community News. Follow that. We're going to be tweeting about uh, the actual news stories we're covering, uh, along with announcements for the the live streams and the podcast. Um, in addition to that, we have a, a new YouTube channel that you're going to be able to follow too. Uh, so you'll be able to subscribe there, um, get notifications about all of these live streams, as well as check out our our previous uh, previous streams for the bots, um, and then. Uh, Finally, Jay, um, you're going to be going to DjangoCon next week. We've talked about this a bunch before, uh, but now you're not going to be there just as a keynote speaker. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I am doing all of the things at DjangoCon right now. Um, I've got, I've actually got someone picking up stickers, which, hey, I'm going to have stickers because we are an official community sponsor of DjangoCon. Uh, I'm going to scroll to the bottom with the community members there. Uh, so alongside of the PSF and the DSF and DEFNA is, boom, Python Community News, where uh, I'm going to be there. I'm going to have stickers. I'm giving a talk. I'm going to be also doing a booth thing for work. But I'm also going to be interviewing people to hear what they think that the Python community should know more about outside of pip installable things. So if you've ever wanted to be on the show, uh, next week is your chance. Come find me at DjangoCon, and we will uh, we'll do a quick, probably like one to two minute interview, and get your thoughts as well. And I'll be I'll be participating online, so uh, not in San Diego as much as I wish it could be, but I'll, I'll be I'll be joining you know through the chat platforms, uh, and and definitely tuning into all those. Uh, excellent talks that, that, that are going to be presented there, uh, plus some of the exclusive online-only content. So join me there if you haven't. Uh, virtual stick, uh, virtual tickets are still uh, still on sale. Yeah, and I mean, not to mention that this might, you know, this might be the start of something you see more often where we're at conferences and we're wanting to get feedback from people and maybe we'll have a little bit of swag that we can give you as well. But um, hopefully our goal here is to not just bring news from the community, but bring news actually from people in the community. Uh, and the only way that we can do that is by getting out there and talking with, with everyone. So hopefully you'll see us more at events like this. Um, John, I might've missed it, but did you already cover that? We also have a wonderful new uh, GitHub org that people can go to, to submit their topics. I did not cover that yet. No. So we, right. we have a, a GitHub organization uh, and a repository uh, called topics um, that you can use to send us any information you want to you want to share with the Python community about the Python community. Yeah, That's so github.com slash python dash community dash news slash topics. Yeah, and our our goal here is to make it as easy as possible for people to let us know the things that are going on. If, if you just saw something that was a pass by, just tweet it at us at Pi Community News. If you have some time to fill out the details, please help us out with that by uh, submitting one of those issues. And everything is still the same in terms of issues. We still have great templates to help you figure out what type of content it is and, and how it's going to be most impactful. Uh, that said, John, do we want to jump into some of our main topics? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so we shared, uh, I think, a couple of weeks ago um, that the Django uh, developer survey for 2022 is up and accepting responses. And uh, in addition to that, uh, the Python community 
developer survey is, is now also online. Yeah, and this is a big one. This is the one that, you know, at the beginning of the year, everyone is sharing the links of like, oh, hey, you know, this is this is what people in the Python community think. And it's, you know, tens of thousands of people fill out this survey. That being said, there are more than tens of thousands of people using Python. So as I know John is adamant about fill out the survey, let your voice be heard. It is up now and I encourage everyone to, to go fill it out. And I'm going to do a quick little thing and throw a, throw the link on the screen there uh, in case you're wondering how you can do that. Yeah, so and be sure to go fill out that survey. Yeah, it's, it's a relatively short survey. It takes 10 or 15 minutes. Um, there are a bunch of questions about the way you use Python, the kinds of libraries you use, et cetera. Um, and uh, as, as well as a couple of free form uh, text boxes where you can share additional thoughts with the PSF. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't take very long at all to actually get your answers, you know, recorded and set to, sent to the PSF. And this is one of the best ways you can actually make your, your opinions heard about Python and you know, the future and direction of right, both the language and the ecosystem. And, and I can tell you as, you know, someone whose job is to advocate for Python developers, like big companies look at this data and they use that to kind of direct where they're going to be, you know, focusing in the upcoming year. So if you have a thing that, you know, you would like to see more of, if you have a focus that you wish there was more attention brought to, like filling out surveys like this one, especially this one, uh, is probably one of the best ways to get your opinion and your thoughts, like in front of the eyes of the people who make those products. Speaking of the, you know, big companies, uh, we had a couple of big events that happened this week. The first one, uh, Meta Connect happened, and I'm I'm sure people are wondering, like, okay, what does this have to do with Python things? This is definitely like a conversation that I want to have with John about kind of the future of Python work. Um, Mark Zuckerberg wants me to believe that it's all in the metaverse. Uh, and uh, he's kind of doubling down on that with this this new uh, MetaQuest Pro, which uh, is a $1,500 headset. It's 40% slimmer than the previous Oculus Quests. Um, you know, bigger storage, brand new chip in it, eye tracking, all of these things. And they even announced some partnerships with uh, some big companies like Zoom, Microsoft for Teams, uh, Adobe. Uh, I think they even said something about like Autodesk. Ha they have support with Autodesk now. Uh, my question to you, John, is, is this going to change how Python developers interact and collaborate across the internet? I mean, that's a that's a difficult one to answer. I, I can't predict the future, but personally, um, you know, I think we've seen a lot of this kind of conversation around developer productivity, especially over the last few years where uh, more and more people are working remotely and working from home. And right, in general, uh, all the coverage that I've I've seen around this topic is, you know, everybody's more productive than they were, right? Um, companies are making more money. Uh, people are, you know, doing as much or more work in less time. Um, so, you know, from that standpoint, it seems like a non-problem to me. Um, you know, we're, we're going to solve the problem of everyone's already very productive is a is a pretty uh, strange place to start from. But um, at the same time, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that this is going to, to kind of get me to interact more with my colleagues. Right? Mm. Um, uh, you know, the, the kinds of things that, that, that I've heard from, uh, from other people is, is that I miss being right in person next to someone. Uh, I'm not sure how this really uh, improves anything over the the state of right a video call like the one we're on now. Yeah, and and I think about that because 
you know, we, we get on this call and for those that don't know, we get on the call probably about 30 to 45 minutes before and we're collaborating. We're going back and forth. We're talking about, you know, all the, all the behind the scenes stuff. And I don't know if a headset's going to bring anything to that. And when I look at it the other way of like, we actually have some like Python projects that we work on together. I don't want to have a headache because I'm trying to solve a problem. And also because I'm trying to adjust my glasses to fit inside of a headset that's going to die every two hours. Like, and, and it's not even a dig on the, the device itself. Like the device I have, I have an Oculus quest and seeing, Oh, 40% lighter. Okay. That, that sounds great. Like I, I love that idea, but just the overall feeling of, is this going to change how I write code, how I collaborate? I mean, unless unless they do some really fun stuff with people pointing at lines of code on a whiteboard, like I don't I don't see it changing. But you had a really good insight about like what does it actually take to change someone's like com- uh, how people at a company work? Like how do you how do you actively change that? Uh, re- rephrase that for me because I'm not recalling the specific point you're you're trying to bring up. I, I think you, you had a, a comment about like all of this stuff is great, but like it doesn't necessarily change like the culture of a company. Oh, sure. Yeah. So this was, uh, I think, one of the things we were talking about in terms of, um, you know, more, more than just the headset was some of the like AI summarization of, of meetings and things like that. Um, and right at the end of the day right if you're having a meeting you know a company wide meeting with however many people on a zoom call focused on one person um and whether they're on you know their laptop looking at their webcam or they're wearing a a quest headset um it's still it's still the same right we're getting everybody into one big meeting uh for you know an hour and a half to uh, to, to have right two people come to a decision um, right as as much as right, I, th- I think the idea that this is going to fundamentally change how people work um, is speculative at best right um, but then in addition to that uh, you know I think a lot of people who are programmers would, and work professionally as programmers would say, right, I spend too much time in meetings. Um, changing the location of that meeting probably isn't going to help that. Yeah. And and you kind of hinted at it. Like, it, there are, there's like two battles there. It's not necessarily the battle for, you know, meetings in a different setting or meetings in a different scene. And I, I feel like that is the challenge of like, some companies are like, we want to make sure that every meeting that's had has the most value brought to it, including maybe taking some people out of the room. And I mean, sure, yes, that's great. But if you're still having a meeting, you know, if you're still spending 20 out of your 40 hours a week, you know, if in that that imaginary number that we, we say is a work week, like if you're spending that much time in meetings, that's half of that time that goes towards, you know, reviewing issues, PRs, writing code, testing, documentation. And the thing that gets me is it's never the the big ticket or the flashy things that get sacrificed. It's all of the little things, all of the things that like, I don't want to say nobody wants to do, but a lot of people are like, ah, I mean, okay, I've got this meeting coming up. Oh, I'll get to the docs later. I'll get to the test later. And and a lot of that isn't even like debt that's seen right then. It's technical debt that hurts people down the road for hours and days and, and sometimes months. And you know, you can't you can't imagine how that productivity impacts someone that's not even at the company yet. Yeah, and you know, you, if you're going to bring up tech debt, uh, this is a this is a sticking point of mine we call so so many things tech debt that are um you know 
far different kinds of liabilities, right? And not not all tech liabilities are tech debt. And right, if uh, you know, to to take the the debt analogy, right? If you're gonna not pay something off uh, because you got a meeting to attend, like if that was actual like financial debt, who's gonna who's gonna allow you to do that? <laughs> yeah, I didn't pay my mortgage because I was in a meeting. Yeah, there there's no there's no good approach there for right we're going to just avoid doing the things that we need to do like pay our mortgage or write our tests and docs um, yeah. because something else is uh is you know pushing us toward our arbitrary deadline right yeah. not all deadlines are arbitrary but uh stuff gets sacrificed for arbitrary deadlines all the time yeah yeah i guess my other uh, question about you know this this sort of thing. I know that uh, there's already been reports of uh, you know painfully low engagement, um, right? Even internally for for metaverse and and things like that. Um, but I guess I I don't have a good uh, frame for how this is actually supposed to change work, right? If it's if it's my actual day to day. Um, other than the meetings work, um, right? What are you and I going to do to to work together, right? Using Quest headsets, I don't know what that looks like. Maybe I'm just set in my ways, but so most of the companies that are talking about you know metaverse or you know any type of augmented reality type of work it usually comes with just that, the augment. So it's not necessarily like all of a sudden you're taken out of your office, you're out of your desk, and now you're you know in this world where dragons are flying over you while you're trying to go through like your your tickets for this sprint. It's it's more of like, okay, I'm I'm working and now this headset is my desk. And what it allows me to do is like reach out for things instead of sticky notes on my monitor, it's sticky notes floating in the air so that I can be still immersed in what I'm doing until I look over and see like, oh, this is my ticket, tap that, and then I just finished it. And I get the desire for that, I, I really do, but what I feel like is still missing is the, this is better than what I'm doing now kind of feeling. I feel like everyone is trying to convince us that what this is is better than what we're doing now. And in some ways they might be right. Uh, we're not really covering it too much, but in, in the Microsoft Ignite announcement, one of the things that they did was create avatars for people who can still feel like they're engaged in the conversation and that they have a presence there without actually having to turn on their camera. Like, I think that there is some value to that, especially when we talk about you know, not you and I, like we get out, we roll out of bed, we turn on a camera and it's like, whatever. But I mean, there are people who want to make sure they have makeup on. There are people that are concerned that they have poor lighting and, and all these other things. So I can see how that avatar being there. And when someone starts talking, that avatar shows up instead of just a little circle. Like I can see how that gives people a sense of like, I participated in this meeting better than just the standard initials in a Zoom call. But I think that there's still a long way to go before that value add of like, oh, but also you can, you know, jump into your code and be standing on the lines and walk through it that way. Or there's actually a rubber duck that you can tap that somehow connects to like GitHub Copilot that's like, oh, did you mean this? And like, I, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if that's going to do the fundamental changes. And I mean, I don't think anyone is straight up saying that, but I think that's what they're trying to get to is like, here is this thing that no one's thought of that you can now do in a metaverse. It's going to just grab your attention so that you can use it and be like, okay, that was fancy and stuff. But let's be honest. The only thing that really helps me in this is that I have this other thing that isn't as flashy, but it is kind of helpful. So that being said, let's let's jump into the other big tech event that happened this week, which uh, before we do that, I will say uh, we're talking about Microsoft. I work for Microsoft. Um, I'm going to do my best to not let that sway anything that I say. But of course, I, I want to make sure that it, it's clear 
um, that, you know, if bias does show up, that, that might be why. Um, but Microsoft Ignite happened and, you know, obviously I sat through the, the really long presentation. It's like a full day thing. Um, and there were a couple of things that I wanted to talk about kind of in that same vein of what can companies do to make the technology, I guess, a little bit more helpful for Python developers. And I'm not going to give you this. The, the book of news, if you want to see all the things that happened, is a really great uh, thing that you can check out. I will just copy that link and put it in the in the chat because, again, it's a lot. A lot of stuff happened over like two days. But one of the things that they had announced was this idea of Cosmos DB now allowing for Postgres uh, SQL commands. And Cosmos DB is Azure, Microsoft Azure's like NoSQL data structure. And they've always done some stuff that allows for like SQL queries in NoSQL. As someone who started programming with NoSQL, like my first database that I ever used, I think outside of SQLite was MongoDB. To me, this is interesting because I often struggled. I, I often struggled with this idea of like, okay, if I'm doing certain kinds of things, then NoSQL was the way to go. But then like, often I'm just grabbing data that's JSON and I just want to grab that. So now I have to create some like, like unstructured to like structural database, like mapper and all this other stuff. The idea of this is take data as it is, NoSQL, JSON, Python dictionary or whatever, throw it into a database and use it as if it were a database. And to me, I think that while DB admins, SQL admins, the people who get really upset when you start trying to compare SQL and NoSQL databases, I don't think they're going to use this. But the people I do think that are going to use this are the people who have some pretty simple data and just want to get a proof of concept done that want to just not have to think about what type of data am I working with? How do I structure it? Uh, John, what do you, who, who does this kind of technology help? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head there, um, right? When I'm going to be taking a, you know, a database into production, that's going to that, that's a good fit for a SQL database, whether it's Postgres or some other um, other SQL option, you know, that that fits those needs well, right? Once something is all spun up and right, you're you've you've got a normal kind of developer workflow where you know, you're you're doing your SQL migrations. Um, through, you know, maybe, maybe it's through a framework like Django's ORM or, or SQL Alchemy, um, right? That leads to, right, some, some of the more um, expected performance characteristics and uh, well-established workflows that exist already. But, uh, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of people who aren't doing that day-to-day. -day. They, they don't want to deal with, right, um, I got this big batch of data from somewhere and, and I just want to get information about it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's more information than is reasonable for me to right, just kind of like read through a file. Um, and I think one of the uh, most interesting things here is you said it's compatible with uh, Postgres or Postgres it's queries, right? Yeah. Which means it's going to be, usable by a bunch of different uh, tools that are already built out to use Postgres, right? And that, that's where I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the power comes from uh, when, when you're, you're saying, Hey, we have this, this, this new thing. And there are other tools that aim to work against existing APIs like that all the time. Um, one of the bigger example is right. Amazon S3. Yeah. Um, if you've got an object storage API, chances are it's compatible with S3s. Uh, and that means that now I don't have to sell this as, right, I want to take this new tool and build out a bunch of stuff, you know, a bunch of custom logic that, that I didn't previously have to work with in order to use it. I can dump, you know, a whole bunch of data into, into a place and use something that already gives me 
uh, you know, those those helper functions, those those kind of query li- uh, querying libraries that that can make me even more productive um, without worrying about right now. I'm going to figure out how does this data all actually have to be structured to fit together correctly. Um, and so, you know, students, hobbyists, somebody working on proofs of concepts, um, anything that is that is really um, you know, not in that uh, state of I want this production ready, um, you know, SQL setup that already follows my normal developer practices. Um, yeah. I, I think that kind of approach is a, is a really great solution for. One of the other things that I think about with this, and I'm, I'm trying to make sure I keep a salesman hat off on, on this one, is the idea of like multi cloud solutions. Uh, you know, we we live in a time where if if a cable that's running in the Atlantic Ocean all of a sudden goes down, like half of the websites on like that most people go to also go down. And one of the things that a lot of companies have tried to do to to kind of create more site reliability is this idea of we don't need to go with one cloud provider. So then you see you know, AWS and Azure and GCP being used interchangeably. And I think, like you said, with S3, I think this allows for maybe a little bit easier navigation of information between those services. Again, I don't necessarily think it's a a general win for one, you know, product or company versus the other. I think what it does is it allows you to take information that exists in one way, and move it over quickly with, especially when something like site reliability, speed is the name of the game. Like it's, it is something went down. I need things going from one pipe to another pipe as fast as possible. We can even deal with a little bit of degradation of service as long as the whole thing doesn't go down. If that just means I'm taking raw log data, I don't have to worry about putting a schema in front of it. I just want to throw that data in and trust that it's going to work to some effect without having to add, you know, 10 more SREs to just focus on this one scenario of like, oh, I need these SREs focusing on AWS, these SREs focusing on Azure, these SREs focusing on GCP. Like if it's just, I have some data, the data was going here. It had all its transformers there. Oops, that went down. Now it's going somewhere else and it's, it's fine. Like we're there. To me, I think that solutions like this, solutions like the S3 one, as you mentioned, these are great. And I, I honestly think that we're seeing more and more companies kind of move towards this, like, let's standardize on how do we all read the same data? Um, Apple announced some stuff with like Matter, which is a way that, you know, multiple home IOT stuff can interact regardless of what service you're using. And it's not just Apple doing that. It's Apple, it's AWS. It's, it's you know, I think even Google is a part of this as well. So whether you use an Echo, whether you use a HomePod, whether you use a Nest Hub, you can call out your home speaker of choice and things will just work and they work in, a, in their, what's the word, interoperable uh, with one another. I hope that you know, I'm, you know, again, me being a Microsoft employee, I'm kind of glad that, that we're doing this because, you know, we're going to talk about something that a lot of companies are doing now that I know that you're not the biggest fan of, uh, but it it happens when one company says we're going to do a thing, the other companies are soon to follow. So them saying, Hey, we're going to support data structured, non-structured, you just put the data in and we're going to work with it in how, whatever query language you, you want to throw at us. I'm looking forward to all of the services bringing that. Yeah, and and I do want to, um, you know, not paint this to be a uh, more perfect picture than it is, right? Yeah. Um, as, as much as API interoperability is great, um, you know, often what happens is once you get past, you know, those first few examples, <laughs> the, the, the stuff that's tested well in the docs, right? It, uh, you you run into those little behavioral quirks that are that are different in you know this backend versus uh, versus Postgres and uh, you know one of the big um, reasons why you see people use um, 
ORMs, right, is like it, it abstracts away, right, the database backend, right? I can I can use this ORM and now I'll I'll run my migration files and they'll work against whatever database I want, um, except as soon as you, right, uh, for 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 Django, for example, um, you know, there's there's a package of Postgres specific utilities, and right as soon as you import something from that, you can throw out all of the notions of uh, now, now this is going to be completely compatible across all the databases, right? And so, um, super helpful still. Uh, but but it is one of those things where uh, you're you're gonna get to a point where you need to start saying, well, you know, the behavior of these databases is differing now, and I have to pick which direction I'm going. Um, and so that that'll be a thing that uh, that that people will run into. And um, it's a it's a common project I've been you know, a part of a bunch of different times of like, hey, we built this thing out using these technologies uh, that, you know, are maybe not used elsewhere in our company's software stack. So we need to productionalize it and move it to, you know, the 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 tooling that we can already support. Um, and, and I think that's the kind of, uh, you know, stage of a project that people are going to have to prepare for if they're, um, you know, if they're using tools like this as kind of like a, a shortcut to get me to a, a shareable result faster, that may or may not be right the real end game. I, I totally agree with you. And one of the other things that we I wanted to, to kind of talk about with some of the things that got announced, I'm, I'm trying to find it in the, oh, here we go, uh, was this new, this new product that, Microsoft is calling syntax, which not syntax, <laughs> syntax. Uh, and, and the idea of syntax is that there are certain services that will take advantage of the partnership that Microsoft has with OpenAI and GPT-3 uh, to ease the process of creating different solutions. And, and I mean, we're talking about things like you know, doing stuff like Power Automate, where, for those that don't know, kind of like a drag and drop methodology for automating different tasks across Office 365 and outside of it. Um, and the reason I want to talk about this is this actually goes into a, an area that I'm passionate about outside of my job, which is like automation. Um, I'm an automation person. That That's a thing that I like to do in my free time is make my blinds go up and down and all that stuff. But like, we actually have tools that we use now, like in my job to help consolidate all of the, the information that comes in on a regular basis. I work on a team where our job is to hear what people are talking about in the Python community. And there's a lot, again, Python's one of the, it's one of the largest languages on the planet. It's taught in schools. There are people asking tons of questions. And I want to be there to answer some of those or at least provide ideas of what kind of content we need to bring in next. So what we do is we have a bunch of RSS feeds that just, you know, all get consolidated and then get brought to us in kind of digest form. And, you know, there's websites that we can go to where we can click and say, OK, take out all the Reddit stuff, take out all the Stack Overflow stuff. Give me everything that uses these words. And we're compiling all of that, not with you know, feed parser, we're using Power Automate because it's just faster to get off the ground. And, you know, John, I, being being the person where I get to talk to you a lot, you know, we, we talk about the idea of what is the role of, you know, AI assisted development and all these other things. And to me, this is one that I kind of like, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to challenge you because, but I, I, I would say that in some of the other areas where you have questions on attribution and licensing and things like that, this to me is the step that I hope that tech companies can go into. Yeah. I mean, I think attribution is a, is a really critical part of it. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll say that in the context of things like um, 
GitHub Copilot, for example, right? Uh, if if you go and you look at some of the criticism of GitHub Copilot, um, you know, one of the one of the things that people bring up is, look, I've been able to reconstruct a particular source code file uh, by by starting with a uh, you know a, a set of strings for GitHub Copilot to to complete against. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't think that that is the specific, um, the, 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 the only case where, where attribution is, is necessary. I think it's just the most illustrative one, right? Yeah. Because when, when you can do that, when you can say, right, I'm going to start this file and, you know, it, you know, this automation tool ends up with a, um, a, a particular uh, source code file from an existing open source project uh, or maybe an existing proprietary project. Uh, it, it's, it's easy to say, well, look, this produced this thing that I can verify came from somewhere else um, because it's, it's otherwise unique. Um, and that, that kind of brings to the front uh, the, the the fact that we have to talk about attribution, right? Yeah, it, it's not just that attribution uh, is 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 a thing in these cases where look here's this one exact source file that I reproduced from a particular uh, uh, open source project, but it's what that suggests about the rest of it, right? Um, because it won't always be obvious. Right. Yeah. And and, you know, you see you see this all the time where people are like, oh, I copied this function from this place. Um, and a lot of people will leave a little comment that says, you know, look, this came from, uh, you know, this Python script I found at this GitHub link. Uh, but when all of that is kind of stripped out by design, um, it, it makes it, you know, a, a difficult tool to, to work with you know, both ethically and uh, potentially legally, right? Because yeah. um, right at the end of the day, if I'm using a tool like this, right, um, I think that I'm the person that's going to have to answer for it if it, uh, if, if it does, you know, get into uh, a troubling situation, right? Um, but automation is great you know, yeah. at the same time. Um, and so I think there are ways to... To approach this, uh, we're just kind of in the early and very hectic days of it still. Yeah, and and I I was thinking about this more as I actually had a conversation with uh, someone who's in the chat right now. Shout out to Kojo, uh, who, I, who I get to hang out with in a few days at DjangoCon. I mentioned we were sponsoring that. Uh, I just want to I'm like proud of my like I'm proud of us. Like hey, we're sponsoring a conference. That's kind of dope. Uh, but one of the things that I think that you know, we talked about this with the meta conversation as well of like, there's that end of the road thing that like, this is going to be the thing that helps a lot of these tools kind of grow and become more useful. And I really, I really think that some of the direction that they're going with some of this AI assistance stuff is is going to be beneficial and again I'm, I'm saying this with all of the disclaimers of like yes i work for the company that that puts this stuff out and i haven't talked to pr about this so like i'm trying to watch what i say carefully but i i wanted to i wanted to kind of get your opinion on some of these things that i don't think a lot of people are talking about when it comes to ai assistance and a lot of these are actually new because they were they were just announced this week so the first one is the idea of, you know, we talked about Power Automate and it's this idea of you have a bunch of cards. If anyone's used a tool like um, Zapier or like, I think Trello has like this automation style now as well. Um, I'm not sure about the other cloud providers. I don't use them all that often. Um, but you have this idea of like, okay, when an RSS, you know, entry gets added, send me an email. Sometimes we overthink how easy it is to say, let me go to the RSS card. Let me add that tie in. Let me go change a couple of values. And then now let me go to the email thing. Let me set up my SMTP information and all of that stuff. And then let me connect those two things together. 
is it okay to just be able to say when a new article from BBC comes in, email these three people and then have all of those connections be set up and know that that was done using open AI or GPT three technology? Well, I'm going to uh, do a very, very quick aside and say uh, <laughs> my kingdom for a su suitable Yahoo pipes replacement. <laughs> Uh, because so many of these problems uh, were were so trivially solved with it, and it, and it was great. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on it depends on the context, right? Yeah. Because uh, if you were to say, go find some code that was open source and the license allowed for this, and just grab the you know the piece of code that says get uh you know fetch from rss and the piece of code that says email three people and glue them together that's a lot of what what we do as python programmers right python's a yeah. great glue language and it's and it's just connected all these pieces uh to end up with a you know a pipeline of uh of automations that gets you the result you want but uh the issues really arise where um you know we already talked a bit about attribution Mm -hmm. uh, but also, right, the terms of the license might not allow you to, um, right, take that and redistribute it under yeah. whatever license you're using, right? And so there are, um, th there are a lot of, right. I th I think that the the concept is great, right? Yeah. Uh, because it's programming, and and you know we talked about this uh, a while back, uh, you know, just you and I. But, you know, code isn't syntax. They're not the same yeah. thing, right? And um, th there was a, a, a recent um, interview that I recall, uh, I think maybe it was Simon Willison talking about, um, you know, what, what this looks like now as constructing prompts for, uh, for these AI tools. And mm -hmm. right, that's code. It is. And, and it's, it's code that we might not, totally understand yet um but at the end of the day you're you're writing an instruction that causes a computer to do something and give you back a result um and so I, I don't really see this as as any different um and i and i think it would be you know a, a super useful tool if um if approached uh you know under all the licensing terms and and, and yeah. things like that and i think there will be legal conversations uh, about where these tools go in the future. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see when those legal conversations happen in terms of when they become, when, when the tools become widespread. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think the law tends to lag behind. So, so we're going to see a lot, a lot more of this kind of conversation before we actually see, um, you know, anyone, anyone really challenging it, uh, in, in any sort of, you know, law situation yeah and and i only have one more and i'm gonna i'm gonna keep it brief because we got one more topic before we get to the the conference rounds here uh, uh this was a tool that it, it's been available for like demo but i think they officially announced a little bit more information about it but it's the idea of copilot labs uh and people at this point, I'm assuming that people know what Copilot is. If you give it a prompt, it gives you some code. Uh, it tends to understand what language you're using and things like that. It uses GPT-3 to do all that. And this is where a lot of those conversations about licensing and attribution come into play. Um, Copilot Labs is designed to do something a little different. This is where you take code that you have and you select it. And when you give it to Copilot Labs, it gives you a synopsis of what this code is doing. Um, and to me, I thought of this as a great tool for beginners. Uh, you know, I don't want to say junior developers. I want to say like people who are just getting started in code, uh, people who are new to a company and they're like, you just gave me all this legacy code. Now I got to figure out what all this legacy code is doing. And like, I want to be able to select this and kind of get a, a good breakdown of kind of what's happening based on, you know, localized knowledge, localized interpretation and things like that. Um, more than anything, John, I wanted to to kind of get your opinion on what are what are some of the areas where you can see this being extremely helpful and maybe not as 
uh, polarizing in terms of is this okay? Is this not okay? Yeah, I mean, I think that any any context, I would use that day to day. Yeah. Right. Um, what the heck does this line of code do? Because, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I can't follow any of this code that I wrote six months ago. Or and, Jay wrote it you know, two years um, ago. <laughs> and and so that that's going to be certainly super helpful. Uh, and there are kind of, um, you know, more purpose specific uh, uh, and not AI backed tools that will do things like tell me what this regex says or tell me what uh, what this cron tab says, right? Uh, there's, a, there's a cron tab tool that um, people use uh, pretty regularly because, you know, I, I've got this line that says five stars in it and what does that mean, right? Because it's easy to swap those and forget what place uh, a, a, a value goes into. Um, and so there's absolutely, you know, great, great potential for uh, things that tell you, right, explainers is is, is basically what, what we're coming down to here, right, is a, a tool that explains any particular piece of code to you. Um, you know, I'm sure it'll suffer from the the same errors that any other one does, though, is like, is this correct? Are there weird corner cases where this, this tells me something that's actually different from what, what the code is going to do? Um, and that might be for a bunch of reasons, right? And it yeah. might be uh, because there's a problem in the tool. It might be because the the library that it's summarizing is buggy. Um, and and so, you know, I, I don't think it's ever going to replace, right? Um, going going through code line by line by yourself, but um, certainly uh, as a as an assistant, as an aid to right, really grokking a code base um which is a huge part of the job right is knowing what what's actually happening here before you modify it um I, I'm, I'm i'm in favor of those tools and i think that it's um I, so this this tool is new to me um and i i think that it'll be uh i'd, I'd want to see more information about like how it actually works right um because um you know, it, I'm, I'm tempted to say that there's a similar attribution conversation there, right? How does it know what the what the code does? But there might not be enough of a kind of creative work to really make that um, uh, a, a conversation worth happening, worth having. Yeah, and and one of the things that it, I mean, it does is it, it can also take code in one language and kind of spit out what it would look like in another language, which I think that's where it comes to like the reaching out and grabbing, you know, or you know, working off of its trained data. There, um, I think ultimately what you're trying to say, and, and I fully agree with you, is that we want we want to make sure that like you know we're not going to immediately say that all of these solutions are bad or all these solutions are good, but we, we want to make sure that there's a level of responsibility that is uh, brought and that those conversations can keep being had because, you know, we don't have an AI bill of rights and we don't have this like blueprint for, you know, ethical usage of AI. Or do we? John, you, you brought this next topic into uh, to my attention. I actually didn't know about this. Yeah, Jay, this is this is super interesting, and I definitely want to get your your thoughts on it because I think you've done uh, some related work here. Uh, but yeah. this is uh, an announcement that the White House made, uh, along with a bunch of other tech related um, uh, kind of guidance. Uh, so I, so I don't think there's right. This isn't this isn't you know some law has passed or or anything like that it's it's just like these are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about in the context of um big tech and how that applies to um you know people's rights right and and so this in in particular uh talks about uh, a, a variety of topics one is um uh sorry about that uh one is uh privacy Right. So 
what what you do with uh, with the data that uh, or what what you what companies are allowed to do with the data that they collect. Um, so if I if I give you data for a particular reason, um, uh, and this kind of bleeds over into the next topic, which is uh, notice, right? Um, if I give you data to to process a a specific thing, you can't then go and dump that into your your AI system for some completely other reason, right? Um, and uh, there there's a, a big portion of this, at least in my reading of it. Is uh, is safety and uh, and discrimination, right? So um, these are right, systems that are going to increasingly uh, kind of dictate how our world works, um, and uh, there are you know there are already problems with how our world works, and when you when you automate all of that, and when you you ramp up the scale and speed at which those things can happen. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of a lot of things we have to be, uh, you know, take caution with. I, th I think if we use like fancy titles, like automating the world's problems, like we didn't say away, we just said we're automating them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely agree with you. And, and you know, as you mentioned, this is one of the things that I have, you know, I'm passionate about in general. Of just like, okay, we have this data. How are we using it? One, how is my data being used? But then also who has access to this data uh we we talked about it a couple of weeks ago but you know they also announced that you know public and scientific data that's used for federal studies also has to be made public and this is this is more of this this is just defining and kind of modernizing how uh, the federal government at least in the united states looks and takes an approach to the information of its citizens. And I think that, you know, if you thought that GDPR was going to go away, no, we're, we're adding on to it. And the thing that I really like about this is not only the idea of, I can't even say the words now, algorithmic discrimination protection, which is like, you know, there are companies that, that do a lot around ethical AI and creating ethical AI studies and testing for, you know, implicit bias and unconscious bias in algorithms and things like that. But also this idea of how do we make sure that this information that we're using in one way isn't being distorted or capitalized in another way. I mean, we, we talk about, you know, large companies in the US and we, we always hear this word about monopoly. And I think that data monopolies are definitely possible. Like you can have this company that just has so much information about you. They can they can track where you shop, they can track your doctor's appointments, they can track, or not even your doctor's appointments because, you know, HIPAA and stuff, but like they can track, you know, where you are versus what types of things you buy and you know we've we've heard of these nightmare scenarios where like parents have found out about like you know teenage pregnancy because of the shopping habits of the child and whether or not that's okay and i i think that what we have to to do is first get to that level of of modernization for where we can say like okay this is what you can actually do with this data. And I think once we've done that, we can then move into the the next step of that, which is like, what should we not be allowing people to do with this data now that we know that it's possible? And, you know, not, not even to think about it from a term of like ageism or like, you know, regulators not being as tech savvy as we are. There's so much stuff happening. I'm in my 30s and I don't even understand what's happening half the time. And, and you know, stuff just changes so rapidly that I think having kind of these core foundations, I don't want to say like the the AI, was it the law of robotics? Uh, I don't think we're at that point yet. We don't need like the, you know, going down that that path. But I do think that the more that we can start to say, okay, governmental bodies, did you know that connecting these things are possible? Let's put a baseline in of like, you shouldn't be able to say where people eat, 
and what medicines they're on should be a sellable thing. Like if, if we start with things like that, if, if we can start saying if piece A and piece B are thrown together, people can capitalize off that, but it also comes with these unexpected consequences that the individual person didn't consent to, uh, and they may not even appreciate being tied to them. And Jay, I know you've done work around uh, kind of uh, gathering data to tell stories with, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I think I'd be super interested in your opinion from from that perspective of like what kind of data is out there and and how that's going to leak into these sorts of systems and 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 I think that's part of the impetus of of you know the, this sort of guidance from the government. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I mean, we were talking about this just earlier this week, and and we don't we don't need the the screen on now. You know, one of the things that I, I'm doing for this talk that, you know, is happening on Monday is we looked at the idea of, hey, let's take census data and match it to where conferences should be held. And we we talked about things like implicit bias. We talked about education rates and things like that. And, you know, when you look at the the geographic diversity of a place and you look at the the racial diversity of that same location and you look at the cost of living plus what venues are available what you start to notice is that there are a larger you know congregation of diverse cultures in larger cities but those cities are also significantly more expensive which starts to challenge a lot of questions of like, hey, why is it that we do conferences in these places that aren't the biggest city in a state, but like the second biggest? And it's because, well, conferences tend to be cheaper in those areas, but those places also tend to have a monoculture or more of a monoculture. And then when you start looking at those things versus health and safety, you know, I can talk about this being from California and having done research on this, a police officer in a major city has to report their perception of a person's age, gender, and sexual orientation with every single stop that they do. And what we start to see are these things of implicit bias that pop up where people who are who are perceived as trans, not even are identified as trans because the state of California doesn't have like a transgender tag on a driver's license. It's just the perception of someone being trans tends to correlate to longer stop times. And this isn't like on average, this is like across the board. And a lot of that tends to do with like ID verification of things. A lot of this has to do with, you know, things that they might have in the car with them. So when you think of like someone who might have medication in the car with them and someone who's trans that might be on hormone therapy, like you start to see like all of these bells and whistles turning of like now a person's being stopped and asked about the medication that's, you know, in the seat next to him because they just went to CVS because it's not Tylenol. It's not something it's it's, you know, just a bag. And then you think about how maybe that corresponds to people with mental health, which is a very non visible thing. And you start saying, oh, wow, if my police officer can do all of that stuff with their eyes, and Jay can find out about all this data. How did Jay find out about it? Well, all this data is public. And they also have where the stops took place, which means if you have a cell phone, that cell phone data can look at that exact same place and go, let me look at everybody in this area that got stopped for this type of information. And maybe when people are in that area, maybe we serve them ads for the medications that they may have been stopped with. And I'm not saying that that's what's happening. I'm saying that that's legitimately what is possible using data that's already out there and that is required by law to be given and given publicly. So you have to have companies that, you know, you have to be able to tell companies like, hey, we do this because we want citizens to be able to know what's, you know, how their, you know, their law enforcement is acting. But that doesn't give you permission to then use that data to then serve them ads. And, you know, again, it's, it's not that I'm not saying that any company is doing this. But again, I can look at how I would piece those things together and actually do it and like write the code to do it. 
So if me just sitting in my little office where I don't get paid to do any of this stuff, if I can just sit there and go, well, huh, I have this data and I have this data and you know, some company might have this data, I could take all that together and do something with it. Like, okay, if I can think of that, I'm sure people who get paid to think about this kind of stuff could also think of that. And, you know, if we, if we end up with uh, our, our worst problems being we have to regulate advertisers better, um, I, th I think that's a, that, that's a pretty, pretty rosy outlook of, uh, you know, where, where some of this data can go. Yeah. Um, uh, I did have, I know we're short on time, but I did have one more question for you related sure. to this, which is, um, right, we've got these two competing things, right? We've got all of these automation tools that are backed by by AI, as well as, you know, th this guidance that right, isn't necessarily binding, but uh, is, is, is kind of a maybe news of, of what's to come um, right. around right, how you have to approach using these sorts of tools. Uh, and so what do you think that's going to do in terms of someone whose day-to-day -day is is building these systems, right? How does that change their, uh, you know, their, their actual workflow around, you know, I want to create this cool new tool to, uh, to, you know, aggregate a bunch of data and, and, and do something novel with it. You know, thinking about it, you know, as you say it, <laughs> cause I'm like, oh, that's, that's a good question. One of the things that I think about is the idea of uh, a board of kind of a board of digital ethics. You know, often we we hear about you know companies will have a board of ethics of like, okay, if we do this, you know, are we or they'll have like a environmental board, like, hey, make sure the stuff that we're doing isn't you know increasing our carbon footprint by you know seventy five percent because that would naturally be bad, especially for larger companies. But I think what we have to do is obviously you know lawyers are going to keep getting paid. Um, that's one thing that we can we can definitely agree on is that. You know, technical lawyers, uh, even the PSF has one, like it's going to create an, kind of an industry of knowledge that isn't really there right now. I mean, we, we talk often about, you know, what are the things that people need to get into, you know, Python or in, into tech in general. I really hope that what it does is it shifts towards the it's not whether or not you can, uh, I call it Goldblum's law. Like it's, you know, we, we spent too much time thinking about how, whether or not we could do it to, to stop and think about whether or not we should. And I think that once you have this system and we've already seen that with GDPR, you start seeing companies hit with, you know, multiple of billions of dollars in fines. I think once you add on to that of like, okay, now the U S is also doing it and other countries are doing it we're going to have to start asking people how do we build these systems to where we we're not on the hook for this data and you know, i think about that now like i've i've built tools where like i built this demo it has user accounts and then all of a sudden i'm getting an email that says hey this could be a possible gdpr violation you need to start doing like all of this record keeping and all these other things and i'm like you know what, how about I just remove user accounts from this service and just make it so that the data is, you know, available for free or available without a, a sign-in requirement. And the other side of that is, I, I can't say for certain, but I think if we put barriers to how you can use a person's data I think the data itself becomes not as lucrative as companies currently value it. Uh, we talk about the idea of like TV companies, even TV companies, you know, take data on what you're watching and they make more money off of that than they do your actual cable bill. If they're not allowed to do that anymore, now all of a sudden, it's a lot harder to say, I'm just going to sell, like, I'm, I'm going to collect this data. It, it means nothing to me. And in fact, I'm now having to pay people to collect this data that is not as valuable as, you know, the salaries that I'm paying these people to collect the data, you know, with. So my hope is that it drives the cost of, of personal information down. And if it does that, 
Well, we're going to see people have to think about like the, the implications of the way that they're writing their code. But I think we'll also see a lot of people focusing on, Hey, don't, don't put this stuff in here. Don't, don't even bring this up because this is going to be more expensive to us. If we get fined, then it's going to cost, then we're going to benefit from just having it and maybe profiting off of it. I hope that answers the question in some way there. I'm sure we could go on this topic for you know another hour, but um, uh, be, we are, I think, over our normal time already. Uh, we do have a bunch of conferences. Yeah. I want to talk about. I, I don't think people realize that, you know, around fall is when you start getting all the announcements for conferences. So if, and I see a couple of people in the chat now that I know have been thinking about CFPs. Well, we have plenty of conferences and CFP announcements for you. So let's jump right in. The first one is Pajamas Conf, which is now available. You can register and get your tickets. Uh, I've talked about this. Pajama, uh, Pajama is one of my favorite conferences because it's the only one where I can crawl out of bed, be in pajamas, give a talk about Python, and go right back to sleep. And everybody be like, well, yeah, that was expected. Um, it's very laid back, very chill. Uh, and they announced that their conference is the 26th and 27th. But also, you can now register for that event. Um, and up next is we ha we have a conference that is set to be a ton of fun. John, yeah, Bang Bang Con has been around a number of years now and is uh, pretty unique in the world of conferences. Um, there are all sorts of uh, yeah, just fun and and, and delightful uh, talks that happen here. Um, and tickets are now on sale. Uh, so uh, we, we got a link that we'll uh, send out in the newsletter. Um, so subscribe to that if you haven't already. Uh, but uh, get your tickets to Bang Bang Con. Um, this is a, a, a super, um, yeah, just, just a unique and delightful event uh, that I think a lot of other conferences strive to be like. Yeah, and definitely a, a super diverse uh, cast of speakers. It tends to be every single year. So... Uh, excited about that, November 12th and 13th. Check that out. Uh, on the international side, we have PyCon Hong Kong is uh, just got announced. Uh, or sorry, didn't just get announced. Tickets are on sale. Uh, the event is October 29th. If you're in the Hong Kong area or you want to check it out online, go ahead and grab your tickets there. Uh, this entire group of like PyCon, APAC uh, conferences are always like interesting because you know we, we tend to think about things from this like u.s centric focus and like stuff that they're doing out there is just always super amazing and super fun so yeah pycon hong kong is another one and then we also have pyconf hyderabad uh this uh, one I i'm gonna be bad with geography and say i can't remember where hyderabad is uh, <laughs> This this is in in India. I can't, yep. I can't give any more uh, more specifics there. I'm terrible at geography uh, yeah. as well. It's always my worst trivia category. Uh, yeah. But yeah, their their conference um, is uh, recently announced, and also uh, so in addition to uh, I believe you can get tickets. The the CFP is open for uh, about three more weeks, maybe maybe three and a half. Um, yeah. So uh, again, link in the newsletter, uh, but go, go check out uh, PyConf Hyderabad in, uh, in December 10th and 11th. They've got one day of talks and one day of workshops. Yeah. And then kind of a, a new one, the, the site isn't even up yet, uh, but we, we got the tweet. Uh, JupyterCon is coming up and, you know, I feel like Jupyter Notebooks and, you know, I think they originally called like IPython Notebooks. Uh, such a big uh, space. Uh, and I, I, I was talking to someone who's an IT admin earlier today, and they were talking about wanting to do more with Jupyter Notebooks because they feel like it's it's more approachable. Well, JupyterCon is coming. It will be back in the spring of 2023. Um, they're going to be giving out announcements and dates and things. So this is like the announcement for the announcement. Uh, so if you're not following Project Jupyter, you should be, uh, and you can learn more about what is happening there. And then I think we have one more, which is Pi Texas. 
Yeah, Pi Texas is uh, so they've just announced their uh, their location and dates. So they're going to be back at uh, the Austin Central Library. Um, I believe it is April first and second uh, in twenty twenty three. Yep, and and I spoke at uh, Pi Texas last year, uh, and it was at the same same venue. And I will say that is a a beautiful venue, beautiful scenery. You can kind of see some on the website there. Lots of greenery. Uh, it's a great little conference, and you know, in Austin, um, I think eventually it'll probably move to some other locations. But at least for this year and last year, it's going to be in Austin. Uh, feel free to go check that out. Never know, you might you might catch one of us there again. Um, but I think that is going to do it for this week. John, um, did we forget anything? I'm sure we forgot plenty, uh, <laughs> yep. but, but we'll cover that next week. Yeah. And by the way, if we did forget something, if you're sitting there screaming at your screen right now, as we mentioned before, you can follow the new Twitter account that is at Pi Community News, all one word. Um, and let us know. Tell us, hey, you forgot about this link. Maybe it'll appear in next week's episode. Um, but that is going to do it for this week. Uh, I've been Jay Miller. I'm John Bonifato. And this is the Python Community News.